used to not give a f- about discretion. Hey, thanks for joining us. Uh, you know, Thorne and I have been friends for a long, long time, and we would probably do this anyway because we like talking to each other that much. However, it would really mean a lot to us if you would click that little subscribe button. Now, now, now. Today, we're talking about 100 Gex. And I, I got to tell you right now, I don't even know if I'm saying it right. <laughs> <laughs> I love that about it, though. I mean, it's, everything about it is something we're disconnected from. Yeah. And, and I think that's what makes it so attractive to me. You know, even when I look at their Instagram page, I'm like, wow, this is so cool. And I don't think I understand it, but that, that's usually some of my favorite art that like I can't connect with in a, a way of like direct dissemination. Like I'm like, oh yeah, this, oh, guitars. Oh, I love these lyrics, you know? Yeah. The music itself is, and I heard it best described as a distillation of the last, you know, 10 to 15 years of music. Yeah. I mean, it's obvious it's a um it's a product of like mashup culture and you know it's really synthesizing a lot of different genres i guess um i think a lot of people were expect would expect me to do like angry old guy thing and be mad (laughs) (laughs) for sure for sure i mean that's Um, what i expect and i hate to disappoint but um but you missed it on this one because I actually, <laughs> and I thought, am I being trolled, right? Um, I think that's accurate. Yep. Like, yeah, like when people used to try to tell me that the ant word was good and I'd be like, I don't, I don't <laughs> think so. Um, this to me is not, is not that. Um, it's way, way, way less calculated than any of that. And um you probably know I have uh, a soft spot in my heart for chaotic, borderline, unlistenable music. I do, I do know that you have a soft spot for that. It, that's yeah. interesting. That now that you say it like that, um, I should have known that you, this would appeal you, to you more. Yeah. But what's, what's strange, and, and I'm, I'm, I don't disagree with your take that it's, it's chaotic. The unlistenable part's weird because... The first time I ran across them and I, I started listening, I, I immediately was like struck by how confused I was as to whether I liked it. <laughs> yeah. Like I couldn't, I, I, I still can't really. No, but I know that yeah. I, I can't turn away. And I, I, when the songs come on, I listen to them and, and almost listening to them, de- trying to deconstruct what I'm hearing instead of just enjoying it. Like maybe there's, maybe there's a fun in it for me that's like taking it apart a little bit, especially after hearing the songs and then i just i was needed to know immediately know more about them right you know instead of just taking it for what it was because it felt like there was more to it after listening to interviews with them i think though it comes off i think they do what they want but i think there is a level of calculation to it and in the sense that one of the ways i point to that is in an interview i think it was with pitchfork which i'm not endorsing but i'm just saying that's who it was right but um right so um it's an interview with pitchfork and the um they talk about how if they had an intern they they often just it's a thought experiment for them if they had an intern what would they have them do right one of the the things they they would suggest that they would do is take the billboard top 100 for the last 50 years and categorize it by bpms what instruments are on it you know um yeah auto tune no auto tune what pitch correction there was that kind of thing um because I think they're just really interested in what, what a good song is and what the crafting and the, you know, what the oscillation of that really means. So is it audio clickbait? I don't think it's audio clickbait at all. I think they're just like one of the things that they say is, I mean, that's weird to like, look at the, the data like that of something. I mean, yeah, weird to me. I, it weird to us, but like in data driven society at this point i don't yeah. think it's weird at all yeah, yeah, I, and yeah. and because they're looking at it doesn't mean that they're letting it inform of them necessarily like they're like oh this bpm on this song needs to get turned down because that would never make the top 100 i think they're almost more interested in how to push that envelope open right um yeah, and that's that's one of the the, the initial things that I, I was like this is it doesn't sound like punk but in spirit this is punk this is yeah, what agreed. do you know what i mean like yes. uh Technical proficiency be damned. Um, people, you know, when I got into music when I was a teenager, 
um, I was super into like punk and then eventually hardcore. And one of the most appealing things about any of that was, uh, you know, even if the music is not mind blowing and technically proficient in that way, like I was seeing my peers up on stage having fun making something. Yeah, and, totally. and there's a huge appeal in that. Yeah, and, and the, um, just the raw emotive quality of both of those types of music, right? Um, and yeah. I think that there is that to this too. And, and one of the things that as I look at 100 Gex Instagram and their um, videos, I start to see um, a meme culture be really represented, you know? Yeah. Um, and I can see comparisons to other music I like. Um, you need to, they do a remix on that new Health uh, remix album. And I can see where there's crossover there, even though listening to the two bands, you'd never say, oh, this sounds like X, you know, but right. there's definitely ideological linking there. Um, uh, the other thing uh, that I would say relative to, you know, just to, to compliment what you were saying, that they may be skilled at creating music, you know, on a computer. Yeah. But they definitely don't think a lot of their own voices because they um, use autotune all the time. Uh, and I think that that kind of speaks to a, you know, like the three chords of punk, you know, that guitar player didn't really, you wouldn't really call them a guitar player, right? right. But they could facilitate guitar sounds. No, and that's a great that point. Thing. I think that's what's really interesting um, about the autotune thing is that traditionally autotune was used to take um, somebody who, who has a hard time getting on pitch and right. get them there in a way that's not noticeable. It's, it's a studio trick, right? Um, totally. This is a complete deconstruction of that technology. Absolutely. Like, how can we bastardize this and, and use it in a way that's, that's our own? Which, again, I think it speaks back to that kind of punk ethos of it. Yeah, that's true. And, and there, are, there are versions. And I mean, uh, I think, you know, you have to look at people like T-Pain and, and Post Malone, who, who really made that okay, you know, as a, as, a, as, a, as a format. I don't think you would find these guys doing it without those two influences. Right. But, but I do think them looking at the way they look at music history, especially in the last 10 to 20 years, I think that they're probably looking for tools that they can grab and use yeah. that make, make sense to them. Well, sure. And then you end up with this weird jambalaya of, you know, auto-tuned, like, you know, trap beats with auto-tune and uh, some traditional, more traditional EDM elements. Yeah. And then there's like some like crazy death metal vocals in there. And, you know, so it's, they're pulling from a lot of different places. And yeah, I mean, at the end of it, I was like, you know what? This is not, this is not made for me. Like they would, the fact that I even know about the group probably means that they're done. Uh, <laughs> you know, yeah, I would like, say that. It probably, it well, probably means I, they've hit that next level, right? You, you get know? what I'm saying. It's like you have. I do. I don't know that they would have, as artists, would have ever anticipated that there'd be like two forty-something-year-old guys talking about their music because that's not. That's obviously not who they're making it for. Um, right. At the end of the day, that was like these are weird kids making weird music for other weird kids, and I fucking love that. Well, when we, aren't we just weird kids? Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. So, so maybe that's why, why it appeals to us is that, that, that we, we can see that. Another thing that uh, like um, use the reason they use the top 100 as a metric is really interesting. You know, they, they talk about how all, almost all top 100 songs are good. And a couple of times in interviews, someone says, oh, I'd like to beg to differ. Uh, I think in one of the interviews, someone uses the example of Imagine Dragons, which I agree with. Like, I don't, but the they say well hold on if someone played for you thunder like your best friend right was making music and they said i made a new song they brought you into the room they press play and they played thunder for you you'd be like that's amazing like you should keep doing this right. you did something really cool here you know because you'd be you're clouded with that friend thing now yeah honestly i'm it's really an interesting bad. way to frame it it is. I, they're not talking about me because I'm too critical of my friends. So yeah. I would be like, be like uh, delete that. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't like it. But, um, but I do think that the, the metric is really cool. And, and I'm, I think that more of us should look at art with like, that, that kind of metric. As always, we really appreciate you joining us, watching our videos. It also means a lot to us when you comment. 
when you subscribe, like, um, turn on the notifications, those things uh, really add up and, and mean a lot to us too. Um, we are doing this um, because we love it uh, and we hope you love it too.